So if our media and political overlords would like to take this up with Thomas Jefferson, they're absolutely free to. But if it boils down to Keith Olbermann versus Thomas Jefferson and me, I think I like those odds. In 1800, Virginia issued a report, sometimes known as Madison's Report, following up on the Virginia Resolutions of 1798. And in those follow-up resolutions, Madison clarified that we need a remedy for when even the judicial branch betrays us. So it's not enough to say, oh, the courts will put things right. That's not what Madison thought. We need a remedy for when the courts betray us. The courts are not composed of infallible human beings, because there's no such thing. In fact, think about Thomas Jefferson's attitude toward the federal courts. His argument was the federal courts are part of the problem. I mean, you want me to go and refer my disputes to them? They're part of the problem. The problem is the federal government, and last I checked, the federal courts are part of the federal government. They can't possibly be impartial arbiters. And the example I often give on the radio is, I say to the, the radio host, let's suppose you and I had a dispute. I know this would never happen, but let's suppose we did. And then I said to you, I have just the person to adjudicate this dispute. How about my mother? <laughs> now look, my mother, you know, she's still alive, and I want to say in her honor, and, and, and uh, with respect to her, she's a very fair-minded person. She might side with the other guy. I wouldn't bet on it, though. I mean, you know, we have known each other a long time. So in other words, this is clear, right? You don't, when two parties are having a dispute, you don't let one of the parties of the dispute render the decision. And so the idea of state nullification, that the states form the federal government in the first place, they are the principles. The federal government is merely their agent. The employee does not tell the employer what to do. Try doing that, by the way. See what happens. That is not how it is supposed to work. And in parentheses, by the way, if you're ever faced with this objection, sometimes you get this objection. Yeah, 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 I understand the original 13 states, they had convention, they, they uh, sent delegates to the Constitutional Convention, and then they ratified the Constitution. So they created the federal government, I got it. But what about the other 37? Didn't the federal government create those 37? So what happens to your argument then? This is so wrong, I can't even, I don't, there aren't words in the English language to emphasize how wrong this is. And I'll just give you the quick version of why that's wrong. The American understanding is not that the federal government creates states. The people create the state, and then the state applies for admission to the union as a state. So when the people draft their state constitution and approach the federal government, at that point, they are a state already. And so when Jefferson was confronted with the situation in 1820 involving Missouri, he was facing a situation in which Missouri had indeed drafted a state constitution and was applying for admission to the Union. And Jefferson said to them, if you are turned down for admission to the Union, then you will simply be an independent state. So in other words, your statehood does not rely on ratification by the federal government. Your statehood comes from the sovereignty of your people. So this 37 thing is not an objection. Another thing about the federal courts, by the way, the Jeffersonian view was that they're probably just going to rubber stamp what the federal government is doing. Well, how many times can one guy be a prophet? You know, like a zillion? I mean, of course he's right. That's exactly what they do. What do the federal courts spend most of their time doing these days? Going after the states. Because apparently they're all finished going over the constitutionality of federal laws. They've done all that. <laughs> so they've got a lot of spare time, and they're going to... I mean, you would think that would keep them busy enough, but no, on to the states. Now, where does all this come from? I mean, did Jefferson just uh, come up with this while he was drunk, and then he drafted them, and he woke up the next morning and said, oh my gosh, I hope I didn't submit these. Look, they're crazy, <laughs> drunken nonsense. No, this, is, this comes from the Virginia Ratifying Convention of 1788. Now, Virginia is arguably the most important of the early states. Think of how many of our important statesmen come from Virginia. And when they were considering whether or not to ratify the Constitution, they were faced with a bunch of skeptics like Patrick Henry, who looked at the document and said, there are clauses here that they will be able to drive, I'd like to say a truck through, I guess that would be anachronistic, be able to gallop a horse through. <laughs> so what, what, what do we do about this? And what was he told? Patrick Henry was told something by the five-man commission whose job it was to write the ratification instrument, that is the document by which Virginia would ratify the Constitution. So these aren't just five bozos. 
These are arguably the five most important people at the convention. And they said to him, Edmund Randolph, a future attorney general, said, oh, don't worry about it. This federal government is going to have only the powers expressly delegated to it. He used the word expressly. This is a limited government. George Nicholas, who became the first attorney general of Kentucky, who also served on this five-man commission, said, oh, and by the way, if the federal government should try to reach for any supplementary condition, those were his words, to impose upon us, we will be, in Virginia, exonerated from that additional power because we never agreed to it. We're only agreeing to the powers in Article I, Section 8. Well, there's nullification pretty much in germ right there. Now, how many students learn about that in, in school? I mean, I guess we could probably safely round it off to zero, right? I mean, this is just gone. It's just down the memory hole. And yet, there it is, it's sitting there right in the records. I mean, I didn't make this up. It's just sitting there waiting to be rediscovered. So again, Jefferson is just building on this original idea. And I talk all about, and if you're wondering, where am I going to find out about this? I'm going to mention a little bit about my book later. I noticed that in the program on the website, it says Tom's going to talk about his new book. And I feel like that's a little narcissistic. Like, hey, let me tell you all about my book. It's super cool. It's got all these chapters in it. So I'm only going to make a couple references to it. But that's what this book, which I indeed am selling out there, uh, is about. I mean, and it's got all this information. You can, and I, I urge you, check my sources. Follow them up. Go online and look up a lot of these old things that are now thankfully available online. And you'll see it's all in there. It's all there. There's a real history, a real and honorable history of the employment of the, the so-called Principles of 98, named after the Virginia and Kentucky Resolutions of 1798. A lot of people say, oh, that was, in fact, I was on a radio show in uh, Missouri not too long ago, and the host loved our interview and said, I want you to come on again tomorrow. Came on again tomorrow, and she said, you know, after listening to you, I wondered why constitutional conservatives weren't all getting on board for this. It just seems like a logical sort of thing. Why aren't they all getting on board for it? And then I looked around, I talked to people, and it's, they said, well, the answer is the terrible checkered history of this idea. And I said, oh, yeah, well, what, what do you have in mind? Like, can you give me an example? She said, well, you know, slavery. And I said, all right, I understand that, well, I didn't put it quite this snarkily, but I understand that every time you mention the states, people think slavery. However, that is not a substitute for historical analysis. Nullification was never used on behalf of slavery, ever. So where are they even getting this? I mean, they just think, well, anybody who talks about the states has sinister intentions. It's interesting, by the way, to reflect that the biggest opponent of states' rights in the 20th century was Hitler. You read Mein Kampf, which not a lot of us do in our spare time, but if you were to flip through to the states' rights section, He doesn't go for it at all. <laughs> he says, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. I want to impose the Nazi ideology on the whole country. I don't care about your crummy state boundaries. I'm going to wipe out all those state boundaries. No, no, no. Every tyrant who ever lived has spoken that way. So this is the way to turn it around on those who say that we must be would-be dictators who want to impose terrible things on the people by means of states' rights. Every tyrant in the world wants to suppress the powers of states so that they can impose their will on the whole undifferentiated mass of the population. So, oh, thanks. Thank you. <laughs> so the real history of the powers of the states and the principles of 98 in America, not the phony baloney one that people think they learned in seventh grade, but the real one is eminently honorable. The New England states employed these principles in defense of their right to engage in commerce against the Jeffersonian embargo. They used it to fight against unconstitutional searches and seizures. And they used it even to fight against what they perceived to be unconstitutional aspects of the fugitive slave laws. So this is an actual history. These things actually happen. But again, how many students learn about any of this? It's like nothing. It's like, the, again, crickets. No mention of this whatsoever. I leave it to you folks as an exercise to determine why it is that all of this would have been conveniently forgotten. But what it all boils down to is this. The federal government will not and should not be expected to limit itself. That ain't going to happen. You do not establish an institution like this, then hand it a piece of paper and say, go limit yourself. <laughs> what possible incentive does this institution have to limit itself? So we, you know, it's, enough, it's enough to dangle. We've tried dangling carrots in front of it. It's time for the stick, I say. Because... <laughs>